Okay, so this is part two of a conversation I was having with David Hajar, who's done a number of uh, important refugee uh, relief kind of projects all over the world. Uh, and he was with us and talking about like, what's the, what's the lay of the land on the ground in the Middle East, particularly in Afghanistan. And now he's going to be talking more about uh, what he sees there or how he perceives what would have to happen. And again, it's an opaque kind of situation. I mean, it's, it's just difficult, but he's going to try to give us some insight. You are listening to The Leadersmith, Darren Gertis. Okay, so so you're a pretty smart guy, and you had all that background to help us see what we could not see before. So does this give you any predictive power to see like what's going to be coming down the pike? And then with that predictive power, what would need to be done to, I mean, because even if a, a majority of the population wanted the Taliban, which generally you don't have to take over by force if people want you, but let's say, even if there was a majority that wanted them, um, you still have a minority that's going to be in grave danger. So what do we do? I, I, just to be clear, I don't think a majority wants them. Okay. Um, but I, I think that, that the Taliban themselves are also aware of the long history of just continual constant conflict and upheaval in their country. I mean, it's the one country that goes just from one conflict to the next, to the next, to the next, and all of them lasting, you know, for, for years and years and years mm -hmm. with little or no resolution coming mm -hmm. out of that. And really their people end up suffering. Yeah. Now, will that play a part? I mean, remember the, the, the Taliban were in power for a period before we went in. And after yeah, sure. the runs and before we went in, so it's not like that's their 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 first rodeo, so to speak, right? Yeah. Um, well, here's a fun fact: Rambo Three <laughs> was about the Taliban, uh, and he was actually support, fighting with the Taliban against the Russians. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Good point. <laughs> Nobody Probably. saw Rambo Three for obvious reasons, right? <laughs> but but um. It uh, that eventually just fell apart just as the movie was released and nobody really cared. It was like, but years later, like 20 years later, I saw it and I was like, whoa, how about that? What? <laughs> it was yeah, precisely, just uh... precisely that, that I think, you know, I'm, and again, I'm, I'm by nature, I'm, I'm more of an optimist. I'm, I'm the person who looks at the bright side of things and tries to think of the positive. Um, I, I don't buy into the argument that automatically that everything is going to be horrible. Okay. Um, but there are hundreds of thousands of yes. refugees streaming into Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. There's a million refugees streaming into Pakistan. I don't know how many are going into Iran. That that seems like a less palatable choice. Um, but but there is going to be a, there is a legit crisis. So what needs yeah. to be done through the crisis? Yeah, I mean, if I were there, I would be leaving. <laughs> I mean, if I, if I, I were in Danny, I would be looking for a way out. I mean, that, that, yeah. undoubtedly. And part of it is because it is a period of uncertainty, right? right. The Taliban have taken over, no mm -hmm. question. They need to establish themselves and it's up to them how they do that. Do they do they do the iron fist and you know we've been see, we've seen a lot of footage right of summer ex executions. Uh, you know. If I were a betting man, I would say that's what's coming back because leopards don't tend to change their spots. I, I would I would agree. I would tend to agree at least initially as they establish themselves and try to quell any initial potential resistance. Now, remember, every over the last 20 years, everybody born the last 20 some years doesn't know what yeah. Taliban rule is. They when yeah. they were under, you know, American influence, Western influence. It's like Iran uh, under the Shah. Under and, the then, Shah yeah. and you have that, you know, the hostage situation. And it's all been a very different place ever since. But I think it'll be worse. That's my it gut. Could it could be. It could be. Um, 
Now, you, you, we started out talking about, you know, Westerners that are still there mm -hmm. and a lot of the uh, Indo uh, Afghanis who actually assisted uh, and, and did business with and were part of the mission um, of the Western, and particularly the Americans is what, what, what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think there is, there is real danger and a real fear about what is already happening and, and could continue to happen to them. Um, I think they are in danger. Um, I, I think that um, if they so chose, the Taliban could do just about anything with them and Absolutely. really not, not fear any any repercussions. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are we going to do? Bomb them? Uh, well, it seems like these are guys that hold a grudge and are uh, uh, are going to take some retribution. And so I, I understand the, the concern, especially for people, anyone who worked with the United States, because we, we really, I mean, this was leadership malpractice, leaving those kind of people behind. That That's just, I mean, it's wrong every way you cut it. What I, what I would want to understand is just in general, like, so, okay, let, let, let's play a game. You are, the, the, the UN gets involved and says, we're going to give you full, um, you know, a credit, whatever, as does the legitimate government, but you have to let our, our aid workers in to provide aid and, uh, you know, take care of p poor people and make sure people have food and whatever. So let's say you're in charge. What do you do? I mean, what's what's your highest priority? Like, so this is all about leadership, right? What is your highest leadership priority to make sure that the fewest people starve, get killed, whatever? Um, how what what do you do? What's your agenda? I mean, I I think that that is a very likely scenario. I mean, even even you know, with uh, in the middle of Iran, we we've sent in humanitarian assistance to help during earthquakes and, and different uh, situations like that, which mm -hmm. I, which I was a part of. Um, I, I think that the, the, the critical part is for me as a leader in charge there is the safety of my teams and, and my, the people going in. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and that, I mean, there is quite a bit of, leverage actually in being able to do that because they need the assistance they need mm -hmm. they need the help for their people so so there is uh negotiating space there <clears throat> the bigger challenge is finding ways to be able to implement the international humanitarian principles including in particular impartiality making sure that the need, the assistance goes to where it is most needed rather yeah. than just going to the cronies of the time. And, and yeah, and we've seen that time and time again. Ethiopia is the textbook example, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, definitely. You know, um, that, that, that is where, um, you know, the regular uh, conflict often erupts right you have your trucks of aid of food you have your ship coming in with all this grain or well afghanistan is landlocked so you wouldn't really but you have your planes coming in with all you know or, or your train and trucks and what have you um and they get diverted or they even get hijacked right and and they you know, the and, and and that happens all the time mm -hmm. so i th i think the critical piece would be initially finding um, individuals in power, some level of decision making. It doesn't have to be the very top, um, but, but people that you can build relationship with and trust to a certain degree, right? I mean, right. There, there's, a, there's a mutual interest, a mutual benefit. Yeah, that needs and, to be and, and there, there is something there because what we know about leadership is that uh, people, once they get into power, want to stay in power more than anything else. I mean, look at congressmen. They want to stay in power more than they want any vote. Right. <laughs> yeah, if it's true in American congressmen, I'm sure it's true with the Taliban, right? Right, no, exactly. So it's it's in their interest, and it's it's a matter of diplomatically uh, making that argument so that they actually 
take ownership of it. But it's in their interest to show and to demonstrate tangibly that they're taking care of the people. Now, I'm skeptical that they actually care about taking care of the people. I'm not skeptical that they want to stay in power. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, but, disabuse uh, me if I'm wrong. No, no, I, I, I agree with you. But what, but part that, that the next step in that argument is that in taking care of the people, you build some level of support or at least so, acceptance. At least acceptance. I mean, if, if, the, if the people are in the current state of flux, trying to figure things out, don't, don't know what they're going to do, in fear, um, and they're not being cared for, they're not getting any food, they're not getting any assistance, et cetera, et cetera, <clears throat> you just have a, a greater pressure building in that powder keg, in, the, in that pot. So, Some of that can be diffused, not, not, not eliminated, but uh, alleviated by demonstrating that, you know, we're coming in, that we're for all of Afghanistan, all Afghanis. Um, yeah. you know, and again, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm just blowing hot air and just, speak. <laughs> again, I'm, I am an idealist and I am an optimist, but I think that a lot of it has to be based on dialogue and building trust, building relationship. <clears throat> Even if it is simply, you know, the, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. There, there is, at least for a period, there is, there has to be ways to creatively work out some level of uh, trade, mutual acceptance, uh, ability to work together. So the, the 2000 article I, I read to my class before the Taliban, right, did not paint them as people who would be at all interested in doing the things that you're saying. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder how much it's likely that they're going to be doing something differently. Now, the eyes of the world weren't on them then. Maybe, maybe something's different where the eyes of the world are on them now, but I, I just don't see it. My question, again, is how okay so what do you do like so your first step is um uh you take care of your your team you make sure that they're they're all safe you probably don't want a lot of americans on that team that's probably <laughs> the, a, a good thing to draw from other places per, perhaps uh more um uh, islamic nations around the world uh because they're probably less in danger okay then you do what? Then you make sure that people have food or sanitation or that there's government infrastructure in place or what, what is it? What are your priorities? Like check your top five part priorities here. What, what needs to be done in order to ensure as much safety as possible for, for what remains? Cause this is just a bad situation. Well, you, you know me, Darren, I'm, I'm very much of a data person and being evidence-based. Mm -hmm. the, the normal, at least theoretical process is when, and you do quote unquote rapid assessments, you, okay. even if it's just drive by, you know, driving through the different areas and, and, you know, observing what's going on, but you have to figure out quickly, you know, very roughly what the top needs are so that that informs your uh, your priority and what you provide. You know, whether whether you know it's water, sanitation, whether it's food, whether it's medical care, whether it's shelter, it, it all depends on probably the area that they go through conflict, you know, where, where they shelled, bombed, whatever, um, you know, have all the doctors run away. You know, there, there are a lot of factors that have to go in. But mm -hmm. for quote unquote good uh, humanitarian assistance, you have to be base those priorities on some level of a factual assessment of the situation. Sure, absolutely, and and I think that's that's brilliant that you have to do that. So uh, let so you're going to have to speculate because we don't actually have that. <laughs> so, no, no, so but, but, in but, your but, experience, but, what comes? first, second, third, after you have done that. I mean, I appreciate that you do that. I mean, it's a kindred spirit to, to an academic to, to hear that you want to be evidence-based. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, um, it, 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 
especially within USAID and and with the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, mm -hmm. um, you know that they DART, the disaster assistance response teams that they send out. They are trained and have all the survey tools and everything already done. And literally, it, it's it's a matter of hours mm -hmm. of driving through an area and to be able to do their very first initial assessment. Um, and and people are on call 24-7, right. rotating to be on the planes to go out there. Now, I doubt... I, 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 would be surprised if we have people on planes going. Probably not our right. people and doing it this time, right? Okay. But so yeah. look, look, look. If we if uh, first aid, right? We see somebody on the ground. We don't clean up their their blood on their leg. We first check to see the are you breathing? If you're right. if you're breathing, uh, you know, do you have a pulse? Those, those right. kind of things. And then we start to work our way down the list. So what right. as you triage? What comes right. first? Right. What's second? What's third? Again, you're going to have to look at, at, at Afghanistan in sections, right? You've got to compartmentalize it. Okay. Kabul is going to be different than some of the rural areas. Yeah, and that's fair, yeah. And I, I think in Kabul, um, the, probably the, 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 first, the, the first priority is going to have to be security. I mean... Like, like in triage, looking for breathing. I mean, the, the, the first the first priority is going to make sure that people are are out of harm's way of Im of imminent uh, harm or death. Um, how how you do that from a humanitarian assistance perspective in a situation like this uh, is is very limited. I mean, obviously, it's not a military force that's going in. But there are certain measures that can be taken of actually moving people out of harm's way. Does it mean mm -hmm. setting up a settlement, a camp? Um, does does it mean you know coming into an agreement to restrict uh, you know uh, certain access by uh, or you know different military components into mm -hmm. certain neighborhoods and certain areas? Um, but I, I think I think that. You know that goes almost hand in glove with the security of our people and our team, right? Because they're just in a similar sure. setting on the ground. So, so you're um, talking about security within the refugee camp. Uh, I'm talking about security within within Kabul and trying to figure out where within the city um, are are there you know the primary hot spots. And oh, haven't we been told that the Taliban is security? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's and that is true in the sense that they control they're in control they right? are in control but and, and the so in that's order, like the wolf being in charge of the sheep though i mean <laughs> well again but now here's the question i might i mean we're talking about providing assistance to the afghanis right right so there are afghanis that are either women that are now too educated for their own good and in danger. No, seriously. No, no, I, I mean, you. just because they are, uh, just because they're now educated women, they pose a threat to that that mentality or that system. I'm, I'm unless I'm I'm missing it or incorrect. Yeah. I, I mean, it's almost like the Chinese Cultural Revolution there into the Afghani's mindset. That, like that's not good. So yeah. those women are in trouble. Christians are in trouble. The underground church in in Afghanistan they they registered pastors within the last year, so they're all in danger. Yep. Um, anybody who supported the U.S. is in danger. So it, we're not just talking about general assistance to help people eat. We're we're talking about something very different, a purge that's about to take place. Yeah, and 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 really for that, I mean the the only possible avenue there is uh, a political and economic one i mean there 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 there's no uh, i don't know of any military force that's ready to go in and try to no there's not i mean you, the the leader the world leader just pulled out and made a big point of pulling out in <laughs> you know it's not like somebody else's it's not like belgium's going to backfill it exactly right? exactly so exactly um, and, and, you know, so, so, so we, we're back at the point of 
focusing on, on dialogue and trying to, to build trust, right? And trying to find common interests or areas where certain uh, political economic pressures might be able to take root or, or, or have, you know, find, find a landing spot. Um, <clears throat> but, but I think that, You know, e even even in other conflicts, whether it is uh, you know Darfur and Sudan, or you know a lot of the various Israeli Arab conflicts, or uh, you know the, the Syrian regime, uh, you know the, the war in Syria, there is a, again a self interest in appearing to provide certain sanctuary, certain um, sure. Um, and it's almost like for self-preservation, for uh, being able to build some level of goodwill and not uh, continually appear to be justified as, you know, the bad, right. the evil, the wrong, what have you, the, the violence. Again, I think going kind of coming full circle, a lot of it will often depend on the individuals who are the local leaders. Okay. And, and, and that'll be more so with the, like the tribal leaders in Afghanistan, because that's like how their system works. Right. But I, mean, but I mean, even within the Taliban itself, right. Okay. They, they have, they have you know, a lot, a lot of has been uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, stories have come out about how, you know, some of a number of these people were, you know, held in, Guantanamo, um, they were released, they go there, they've taken over and so on. Yes, they're holding a grudge. Yes, you know, it's, woe are we and, and, and so on. Um, but I, I truly, I truly believe that as we go from, you know, even I'm sure, I'm guessing, but I'm, I'm pretty, pretty confident that even yeah. within Kabul itself or Kabul, it, there are different sectors, there are different areas, and sure. each one has a local commander, has a local, uh, probably a rel religious uh, leader as well. Um, and that my, especially now when things are still very much in flux, mm -hmm. um, those individuals, to some extent, almost hold supreme power of what happens sure. in that sector. Um, and, and, and so expediency, uh, again, I don't, you know, I don't, don't see myself on the ground there, but if I were, would, would be, um, you know, kind of finding the low hanging fruit. And, and, yeah. and I mean, that, 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 that's. So if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that you're, how, how do I help you? Stay in power by providing these needs, and that's how you, you know you'd be able to minister to people that were on the ground. I, I don't mean, think I mean, it's going to help those people that are on the the naughty list, but for those that are otherwise just displaced or refugees or whatever, you could affect them by aligning yourself with the self interest of those in power. Is that what I'm hearing? That that is true. That is true. I mean. <clears throat> They, they are people too. I mean, they are human beings, right? We don't agree with them. We don't understand them. We don't see eye to eye with them. They think differently. They do things on a different basis. They take decisions. But their reality, and part of that comes from their having been in power before, is 20 years of a completely different Afghanistan experience mm -hmm. and a whole different population that they're now trying to control. And as you pointed out, a whole different global uh, setting where you know there's a lot more media, there's a lot more visibility, there are a lot many more eyes on them, and so on. That it, it it's it is, I think it very much remains to be seen um, what happens. I don't I don't um, expect the Taliban to be the same Taliban that were there 20 years ago in the sense of, um, you know, as um, harsh or critical a, 
an implementation of Sharia law and, and so on. I, I, there's a good chance that I'm wrong. Um, I, I hope you're right. <laughs> I don't see it, but I yeah. hope you're, I, I mean, I hope you're right. I mean, and this, this is a place where I hope I'm wrong. I do see him as being vindictive and taking it taking it out on those that were their enemies for some time uh, because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and th- they hold pretty much absolute power yep. in the final sense of the word not in the yep. sense of the hearts of the people because they'll still be you know standing up on the inside even if they're sitting down but as far as if i if i got a gun to your head i could probably make you do a lot of things no and and and, and i think that that is that is accurate i mean i, I think that you know, it, <clears throat> putting yourself in the place of of, uh, of the Taliban, you have to establish yourself quickly and uh, pretty much ruthlessly initially to subjugate the population, make them stop and listen. You want to cut and nip any type of potential resistance in the bud. So I I I, I wouldn't I am not I would not be surprised. Um, if there weren't, uh, you know, if there were, you know, large scale, uh, you know, retribution, execution, uh, violent acts of, of, of taking revenge um, that are very visible precisely to that end. And to be visible, purpose. intended to be visible, calculated exactly. for exactly. that purpose, exactly. like, like exactly. what ISIS was trying to do to yep. show the world who they were. Yeah, that that is very possible. I would I would not be surprised. <clears throat> but my hope is, and again, keeping in mind that I am this eternal optimist, <laughs> is that because the world has changed quite a lot, and the Taliban themselves have been a part of a, a, a lot of, of, of kind of be, you know kind of swinging back and forth between both sides of the the equation. Um, that there is a greater level of sophistication and understanding, and maybe that translates into a willingness to at least put on appearances uh, to appease some of the powers that be. Now, this a similar argument could be made for the exact opposite, <laughs> that no, no, this is our history, this is our heritage, the reason why we've had all these problems for so long is because it was watered down. You know, the West tried yeah. to change it, and the only way for us to purely move forward is to absolutely clamp down. Yeah, now, that, I can see that argument guess. as well. Um, and and that, so it goes back to my initial premise that it, it's going to depend a lot on the actual individuals engaged, the actual. Pe- one-on-one people that are involved and, and, and their decision taking. So it, it, the structure of the Taliban in Afghanistan. I know that you're not a Taliban particularly expert. This is this might be getting a little bit out of school, but is it centralized or is it uh, decentralized throughout the country? I don't know, but my guess would be that it's decentralized. Okay, and that would make sense with most of what we know about how things work over in that region. Precisely. Right? Yeah. So that, that, that's okay. what I'm making, basing my assumption on. Yeah. So as it's interesting that we're we're looking at these things through through different lenses, but finding a, a great deal of of yeah, I can kind of see this. So one thing that we do know is that people want to stay in power. <laughs> and even bad people want to stay in power and will do kind of good things to stay in power if that is what's necessary to stay in power. And uh, so I, I I am not comparing the Taliban to the American founding fathers, but in uh, my, my dissertation was on the American Constitutional Convention and ratification debates. And one of the founding fathers in, as they were talking about it, says it was, it was necessary to bro, to, to bribe them uh, to to bribe the demagogues with the loaves and the fishes. Uh, what what they're saying is that I think it was Governor Morris who said that. So the idea was we we were we're going to bribe our officials to be good so that they can stay in office. And if they stay in office, we'll reelect them. And as long as you're good, we'll reelect. So, but the same kind of thing is what you just articulated. 
I mean, again, I am not comparing American founding fathers to the Taliban, but but I mean, human nature being what it is, right. Right. Um, they want to stay in power and they will probably work with people who are going to help them stay in power. So, the you know, there is a, a space perhaps for uh, the UN or other organizations to provide some basic, you know, needs or whatever, but that's not going to help them when they're taking retribution. I don't think, I think they want vengeance as much as they want to do that. See now, <clears throat> I mean, p- part of, part of the experience in, in Lebanon or in Syria or even in Iraq yeah, is that regardless of structure and I, I I'm kind of going against my own argument before Mm -hmm. Um, and whether it is centralized or decentralized there are bound to be numerous many innumerable as you want want, want to to say acts of retribution or pure hatred by individuals that are not completely controlled I mean you, you have a bunch of people running around with modern weapons who are in quote unquote in po- feel empowered yeah you know they're, they're you know my neighbor who who stole my chicken three you know six years ago i'm gonna go and 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 kill them and this and there's nothing anybody's gonna do about that yeah now does that automatically mean the taliban are bad and that they're no not necessarily but i think a lot of that is inevitable and, and you're, we're going to see a lot of killing. We're going to see a lot of yep. bloodshed. Um, a lot of it not sanctioned, but a lot of it, as we were discussing, <laughs> actually calculated and intentional and right. highly visible to instill fear and to establish their standing and their power. And it's, and, and it's a difficult process of distinguishing between those. Forgive the statement, in some ways, I'm not going I don't I don't want to say excuse or whatever but understand their perspective of the need of of that and you know highly visible highly yeah, intentional. Yeah. There's nothing we can do about that. Deal with it and and then and then try to minimize the negative continuation. What what happens next? Right? There's there's this hump that we need to get over. Mm-hmm. But the question then becomes, does it continue to be a highly repressive, violent? Uh, and, that, and that's a million dollar question, right? I exactly. mean, so, so as you know, in, in every episode, uh, I have a quotation for contemplation that I pre-select and not, not knowing exactly how the conversation is going to go. But listen to this. It, I mean, con- considering what we just talked about. This is by George Ayetni. I I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right. He said, dictators are allergic to reform and they're cunning survivors. They will do whatever it takes to preserve their power and wealth, no matter how much blood ends up on their hands. They're master deceivers and talented manipulators who cannot be trusted to change. (laughs) I think that's where we are. I I, I, I agree. agree. So it's so opaque. It's so difficult to see what's going to happen but i can tell you i can i can absolutely hang my hat on this one thought i know they want to hang on to power i know they'll do everything necessary whatever the cost to hang on to power now that might be playing nice and letting uh you know some some aid into the country to do stuff but that may be doing just the opposite but they hang on to their power however calculated uh, i I couldn't have said it better. I think I think that with okay. in, in, in innocent as doves, but yeah. uh, wise as serpents. Wise as serpent. Right. That you know, w- we have to make room for assuming and and hoping for the best, but we also need to be very careful and and wise in how we proceed, who we engage with what we allow, how far we are willing to go. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we do is based on integrity. And I think integrity is a critical piece of, of trying to balance those things. There's a the reality on the ground. And, there, and that has both a positive and negative components. You have people's lives at stake. 
right? It, the huge risks involved. Mm -hmm. You can you can sit idly by and do nothing, and just let let the chips fall where they may, or you can choose to engage. and And if you do, you have to have that balance of of being able to, you know. Be willing to engage. Be willing to allow people to be the who they are. Mm -hmm. But figure out how do you work within that morass to try to, from my perspective, I say you know minimize the suffering of the innocent. Yeah. That that that's that's what I'm all about, and that that's I, I think that truly that is the way that that's the only way that we can engage in a potentially positive way yeah otherwise yeah. we're like you know we're like the ostrich who just kind of buries their their head in the sand and that's right there, there's no there's not not an optimal solution here there's only making it as least bad as you can <laughs> as you can make it uh given the circumstances exactly. Exactly. um and working with human nature uh, along the way I and mean, that's what the founding fathers did when they were designing the constitution where we're thinking what is human nature like? And you can do the same thing here in order to try to mitigate the harm as well. Hey, David, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to to come on here and give us this like wealth of perspective and insight about what's going on and why it, it works the way it works and and what's probably around the corner and how I, I really appreciate that. If anybody wanted to reach out to you uh, and, you know, have more of that conversation or, or um, how, how would they do that? What, what's a, a good contact? Um, they could go to the um, excellence and leadership.com. Okay. I'm sorry. Excellence and leadership institute.com. Okay. And uh, there is a, uh, my contact information is on there as well. All right. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I, I know that um, uh, this was kind of short notice, but again, this was kind of a very recent event of what was going on here. And so we wanted to talk about it while strike while the iron was hot. Thank you again. And uh, I'll talk to you, I'm sure, pretty soon. Mm -hmm.